I'm the new executive director here at the Swimley Valley Historical Society. Um, and I hope you will bear with us. This is a tech heavy <laughs> presentation. Um, John has lovingly restored four films for us tonight that you're gonna be able to see. Um, and getting them to work on the technology of the Historical Society has been quite <laughs> the challenge, um, but I think we have it pieced together. So what it's gonna look like is um, I will share my screen with you guys, which is the um, presentation and the films, and I will pause them to let John um, introduce each of them, and then it'll be my screen that you see. So you should see John over in the corner, and you should see me, um, and hopefully this runs fairly smoothly, but I hope you'll bear with us. Um, the films are all ready to go. It's just getting them to you to see, and uh, so I am going to pass it off to John, which, um, John, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. I will meet myself. Oh, right now. Oh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. I hope. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Amanda. Uh, I'd like to thank you for all the work that you have done to help us get this together tonight because uh, it does present, uh, when we do it this way, presents a number of technical challenges. And uh, believe me, it's, it's, your work is deeply appreciated uh, from my part. And um, the other thing I'd like to um, emphasize is that when we restore films for the Swickley Valley Historical Society, uh, we do not alter the films at all. The films that you're going to see tonight are exactly as they were given to us. And uh, what we have done is then taken them to a uh, company that specializes in digital restoration of old films. And uh, what you'll see tonight uh, is the product of that work, which is very painstaking, I might add, and takes a while. Uh, but we're very fortunate to have a company in Coriopolis that does world-class film restoration, and uh, they have done, uh, I think, a very fine job tonight. So let's begin uh, this evening with the first public showing of what we really think is the oldest motion picture record we have of Sewickley. And this is, goes back to August 1928, and it's the Sewickley Fireman's Parade, part of a large fundraising event held by the American Legion. And this was restored from the original 35 millimeter nitrate film that had been stored by Sewickley's own Cochrane Hose Company since it was originally shot. Um, this film it was in remarkably good condition, but because it was on nitrate film, which is very uh, delicate and very flammable, I might add, we had to do some extensive restoration before we could show it. We don't know who the camera person was, but we suspect that the film was um, edited in the camera, which is a uh, term that we would say that the ph photographer had 400 feet of film and then estimated how much time to devote on each of the scenes. So you'll see a lot of short scenes in this film as the photographer tried to get as many of the participants in as possible and still have time left at the very end for Sewickley's fire trucks. So why is this film significant? Well, it is the earliest film, as I said, of Sewickley that we have, but the Historical Society is hoping that there are more films of early Sewickley out there and that uh, maybe we can, uh, we can get, get a hold of them. The holy grail of early 20th century film shot in Sewickley is still Skeins of Destiny, which was shot by early film director Catherine Russell Bleeker. And she shot it here in Sewickley in 1916. And this was a society film. In other words, it used local amateur performers, generally very well healed local amateur performers. And it was used as a fundraiser, in this case for the Sewickley Cot Club. And according to the Herald in 1916, Skeins of Destiny was highly successful. But the film disappeared after that. And then it turned up again in 1963 and it was shown at the Edgeworth Club. And then once again, it disappeared. And despite our best efforts, we haven't been able to locate that film. And the reason for my mentioning it tonight is I'm hoping that maybe it will um, spark a memory of somebody out there who is uh, joining us tonight, and maybe they can lead us 
to some clues to where this film might be because um, it will be uh, if we could if we could do that if we could ex uh, restore that it would be very very exciting. But back to our first film tonight. Thanks to Slickley's Cochrane Hose Company, we go back to 1928, standing at the intersection of Broad and Thorn Streets for the Fireman's Parade. The American Legion Street Fair in August of 1928 was probably the biggest event of that summer in Selickley. And the biggest event of the festival was a huge fire department parade. And leading the parade, five charter members of the Selickley Cochran Hose Company, which was founded in 1870. Hello? The American Legion Band. The street fair was a fundraiser for the Legion's brand new post home on Broad Street. Fittingly, the borough's fire whistle kicked off the parade. The Selickley Herald reported that 26 fire companies from around the area participated in the parade, a total of 345 firefighters. It was the first time that the Cochrane Hose Company had hosted a gathering of fire companies like this. We won't name all the participating departments, but here are a few. The Columbia Fire Company from Bellevue, the Community Fire Company from Valencia, also fire departments from Leedsdale, Ambridge, Coriopolis, Etna, Stowe Township, Beaver, East Carnegie, Ingram, and Bridgeville, just to name a few. Several departments also had fife and drum corps. This is the group from Sharpsburg. Selickley awarded nine silver cups for various achievements by the many companies participating in the parade. Prizes were awarded in categories such as most distance traveled to participate or best equipped fire mm -hmm. truck. Here's the Sharpsburg fire chief and a cool looking roadster courtesy of a local car dealer. We're viewing the parade at the intersection of Broad and Thorn Streets. That's the then five-year-old Selickley Public Library in the background. It's a hot, hazy afternoon, as you can tell. The windows are wide open at the library, and while many of the participants wore their full-dress uniforms, some chose more seasonal wear. Selickley loves a parade, and parades in town are major events. The route for this parade took the participants from the starting point at the borough building down Thorn Street to Academy Avenue, then up to Beaver, where the marchers turned left and traveled down into Edgeworth, going around to Way Park and then back up to Beaver Road. Then it was on through the village all the way to Boundary Street, turning right onto Thorn. The parade then ended where it started at the borough building. Here you get a quick glimpse of one of Swickley's first traffic signals. It's smack in the middle of Thorn and Broad Street. On top is a flashing red light telling motorists to slow down and watch for the divided portion of Broad Street beyond the intersection. As hosts of the parade, the Cochrane Hose Company crew had the honor of coming at the very end. It was a grand opportunity for them because they had something special to show off. Their brand new shiny LaFrance pumper along with their old reliable Seagrave pump and ladder truck. And there it is from August the 4th, 1928. Next, we travel back to the year 1938 and the nation is still in the grips of a depression. In fact, in 1937 and 38, there had been a nasty recession which caused the nation's unemployment rate to spike. And during the depression, the term deferred maintenance came into vogue and Swickley was no exception. As the years went by during those depression years, it became clear that if Swickley was going to maintain its reputation as the queen of the suburbs, some maintenance projects would have to be undertaken. Swickley Borough Council then turned to the federal government for some help and that government assistance enabled the borough to undertake a major project to replace the curbing on most of the streets in the borough. Curbs, you ask? Well, weren't there other projects that might have been more pressing? Well, let's take a look. In praise of the lowly curb, really don't pay much attention to curbs. In Swickley, the curbs are, well, curbs designed to separate the street from the sidewalk and help channel water runoff into sewers. By 1938, many of Swickley's original curbstones were aging. 
There were complaints that they'd become less than attractive, particularly in the village business district. The nation was just emerging from a short but deep recession. Borough Council, realizing that the replacement work needed to be done, turned to the federal government for help. The Workers' Progress Administration, the WPA, approved Swickley's request. The WPA would provide the labor. Swickley would provide the material. Work began in November of 1938 to relay and refinish about three miles of curbs on various streets. Here we see WPA laborers beginning work on Division Street, along a section in front of what is now the municipal parking lot. There were two groups of workers on the job, regular laborers who were hired from a pool of unemployed people in the Swickley Valley. They literally did all the heavy lifting on this project and were paid at the rate of 50 cents an hour. They worked 10 hours a day. The second group were stonemasons. They were union workers paid at union rates of $1.65 an hour, working 28 hours a week. Bust in from Pittsburgh, they squared off and finished the granite slabs. All of the work was done by hand. Each of the large granite slabs were cut, leveled, and grooved. Amazingly, only the top five or six inches appear above the street level. The rest of the slabs are buried and buried deep into the ground. One portion of the project involved the widening of Beaver Street between Broad and Chestnut. Traffic congestion was already a problem on the main business street, and Borough Council had discussed a widening project for a number of years. The availability of free government supply of labor made the project a reality beginning in February of 1939. And here's how it's done. This is a portion of the widening project on Beaver Street in front of the Flatiron Building. The curbstones are lifted into place using a manual crane. The stonemasons have already done their job squaring and finishing each stone. Once the stones are in place in the trench, they're leveled and backfilled and in there to stay. The wider portion of Beaver Street was well received and council did consider widening the stretch between Broad and Walnut, but that never happened. I think we lost our audio here. And uh, what this is, is an example of why the curbing is so important in Swickley. The curb stopped that car from going into a, uh, a light uh, pole. And the Swickley police in their amazingly adaptable 1939 Nash patrol car came in to take the victim of the accident to uh, Swickley Valley Hospital and off they go. Another aspect of uh, safety in Swickley, while we're on the subject, was the safety patrol at Swickley High School. And this is the 1938 group. And here they are in action. That's the Swickley Elementary School, the 1893 Swickley Elementary School in the background. And the safety patrol members took their job very, very seriously. Very important job during that time. By the way, there is no effort of any um, record of uh, any effort to get money or WPA crews to repair sidewalks in Sewickley, but uh, as we will see in, in a, a later uh, presentation here, uh, the conditions of the sidewalks during uh, the Depression were, was also an issue that uh, had to be uh, discussed by Borough Council. 
Our next film, uh, going in 1938 again, we are going to see the efforts of the borough of Sewickley to make some improvements in what we now call the infrastructure. And in this film, a contractor has been hired by the borough to resurface some streets. And what makes this film special is that there, we do see some rare motion pictures of the then new Ohio River Boulevard and the Broad Street entrance into Sewickley. This is another short film shot for the borough of Sewickley to show off public works projects that were designed to improve the look of the town. Some of these were programs that were made possible by the use of labor financed by the Workers' Progress Administration. This federal program, part of President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, was responsible for the employment of hundreds of workers during the deaths of the Depression. In Sewickley, the WPA provided funding for numerous public works projects, including the construction of retaining walls and the replacement of deteriorated curbing along streets throughout town. The idea being that if public spaces looked good, home and business owners would work to improve their own properties. The Great Depression left its mark on every city, town, and village in the U.S. So Wickley was no exception. Budgets were tight and items like street maintenance were postponed or eliminated. The result is that by 1938, many streets in Sewickley needed attention. And here we are on Bank Street, which is about to be repaid. The street sweeper is picking up loose debris. This is what is known as the oil and chip method of repaving. It's the fastest and cheapest way to lay down a new road surface. First, the truck is spreading a light coating of hot liquid tar. Next come the chips, crushed slag spread evenly over the tar. Unlike concrete and blacktop, oil and chip is not only inexpensive, but it was a quick and popular solution to deteriorating streets, particularly during the Depression. But oil and chip remained popular even after the Depression. This method of repaving was used extensively in Sewickley, Edgeworth, Sewickley Heights, and Glen Osmore, right up to and including the 1970s. And it's still used by Allegheny County and PennDOT on rural or lightly traveled roads. In addition to being efficient and inexpensive, unlike concrete and blacktop, the repaved road can be open to traffic immediately, sometimes even while the work is being done. We are having some audio difficulties here, and we, we seem to have lost the end of the audio on this uh, uh, portion of the film. But um, this shows very vividly why uh, oil and chip is not used very often in communities uh, anymore, because it does stir up a lot of dust and a lot of stone chips. This is Park Place, where the old Park Place Hotel stood for many years. It was torn down in the late 1930s. And then the Swickley Garden Clubs and the borough got together and planted it and made it a park uh, very similar to what we have now. And then the background there in that quick shot, you saw a little bit of the uh, boulevard. Here's more of the planting. There's the post office on Broad Street in the background as we look through the Park Place Park. Up Broad Street from um, the foot of Broad Street, a uh, view that hasn't changed very much in all these years. Another familiar view looking across towards um, the boulevard and then up to the bridge. 
This is another familiar view. Um, one thing that we have to note is that there wasn't very much traffic on the boulevard in these days. Familiar view looking into Sewickley from the bridge. And here are some sidewalks. This is what I was referring to a little bit earlier. Um, these were taken obviously by the borough to um, look at, at the problem that they had with deteriorating sidewalks. Um, and again, uh, I, I think there was a I'm question that there was only so much money that they could obtain from the government and uh, they, they did what they could. Uh, they did street repair and they did uh, curb repair and uh, got a lot for their money at that time. So let me just get my notes here, if you'll uh, bear with me for just a moment. Uh, finally this evening, we're going to travel to the year 1968. And this film was shot on eight millimeter film in color for the Sewickley Council of Garden Clubs. And it was discovered a number of years ago by a garden club member who was preparing to move out of town and they came up on a box of uh, stuff in their garage and lo and behold, there was a film uh, in there. And uh, thankfully, the person donated the film to the Historical Society. Now, because we had no projection equipment, the film was just cataloged and stored. And we rediscovered it about two years ago. And it wasn't in the best of shape, but again, we were able to digitally restore it to the condition that you'll see tonight. And while there's no direct reference uh, to this film in the minutes of the Garden Clubs, we believe that it was shot to document beautification improvements in the business district and to show what more um, could be done. Um, and um, so I think what we'll do here, um, well, I do, I do want to mention one other thing as part of the beautification of uh, Sewickley. The garden clubs were very much concerned about this and their concern goes back actually into the 1930s. And they were very vocal about what they felt was a very shabby commercial area. And at one point in the late 1930s, they even arranged a trip to Concord, Massachusetts to view an authentic New England style village. And so Concord actually served as a model for what the garden clubs and even a number of borough officials actually uh, hoped they could achieve in Sewickley. Um, depression, recession, a world war, all of those things kind of slowed any progress that we could see in the village. But by 1968, the garden clubs could point with pride to a number of positive changes in the village. And for those of us who grew up in Sewickley, this will be a nostalgic look back. And for those who are relatively new to Sewickley, this will give you some context into how the town and the village has evolved in the past 50 years. Almost since it was first established, Sewickley was called the queen of the suburbs, a town like no other in Western Pennsylvania. And here we are in the fall of 1968, looking across the Ohio River. So many things catch our eye. The yellow Pennsylvania Railroad work train parked on the Sewickley siding, the white Methodist church clock tower, and a little further back, the steeple of the old St. James Church. And here's the lushly planted classic entrance to Sewickley as it existed before the intersection of Broad Street and Ohio River Boulevard was reconstructed in the late 1970s. Traveling up Broad Street from Ohio River Boulevard past the old post office, which was the post office in 1968. But before we get to the village, let's take a quick tour of some of the other valley communities. We start with an attractive welcome sign at the entrance to Leedsdale. This is the rear portion of an historic house that was once part of Newington, the treasured Edgeworth estate that is still located just a couple of hundred feet down Beaver Road. This particular house was constructed for the blacksmith at Newington in the early 1800s. Another addition also at the entrance to Leedsdale, the new bus shelter built by members of the local Boy Scout troop. The shelter was designed by a Leedsdale borough employee. Just up the street in Leedsdale is Winding Road, the home of Mark Inn Fields. That attractive gaslight was put up by the property owner as part of a volunteer effort by neighbors to make an already distinctive neighborhood more so.
And here's a timeless view of Beaver Road in Edgeworth. You can stand in the same place today and get almost the same view. This is Edgeworth's lovely Way Park. This was land that once belonged to the Way family. They were prominent in the Sewickley Valley in the 1800s and early 1900s. The land for the park was given to the borough with the provision that it remain a peaceful green area. At one time, Quaker Run, the small stream that runs through the park, emptied into a pond, which was located towards the front of the park, about where that small pine tree is planted. By 1930, the pond had been drained and Quaker Run was rerouted to empty into the Ohio River. Whether you call it Upstreet, the business district, or the village, the commercial area has always been the heart of Swickley, and here we are at the entrance to the village with the 1902 Swickley Trust Building. This film was shot for the Swickley Council of Garden Clubs. For more than 30 years before this film was made, the garden clubs had been pushing efforts to beautify the village. As early as 1937, the group attempted to convince landlords and business owners that getting rid of overhead electric signs, garish advertising, and exterior colors would make the village more attractive would also be good for business. What they were asking for was the simple unadorned look of a New England village. One factor making conformity difficult was the sheer variety of businesses in Sewickley. Right off the bat we see a GC Murphy variety store, two women's apparel shops, a jeweler, a children's clothing store, a drug store, and that's just on the first block. Looking further down the street, the Sewickley Theater, showing this week a James Bond double feature. And here's Locust Street, the Valley Produce, featuring locally grown fruits and vegetables, much of which came from farms in Moon and Cranberry Townships. Look at one of Sewickley's oldest and most respected businesses, Hagner Hardware. There's Burton's Men's Store, and another longtime Sewickley business, Miller's Shoe Store. That building on the end of the block is Culloden's Interior Decorating. For years, it had been a drugstore, then a soda fountain. The Coladins then carefully and lovingly restored the exterior. Across the street from Hagner is the Sewickley Hardware and Paint Company. When this film was taken, they had just replaced a large advertising sign with this simple plaque, winning praise from members of the Garden Club. Since the 1920s, shoppers have complained about parking in the village. At one time, cars were permitted to park on both sides of Beaver Street, a situation that often led to congestion. In 1952, the borough ordered the first of several studies of traffic in the village. As a result, off-street parking lots like this one on Green Street were constructed, but no matter how much parking was added, there always seemed to be more cars. Those who parked in the Green Street lot got a less than beautiful view of village stores. It took a while, but by the 1980s, this alleyway had been cleaned up and the view much improved. Here's the south side of Beaver Street, looking from the Broad Street intersection. Hertzburn's Cleaners, a bakery, Sanders Barbershop, an optician, Swickley Fish and Poultry, and a restaurant make up this block. Street, Sewickley Hardware, Isley's, the Penguin Bookshop, and Richard's Shoe Store. It seemed like the variety of businesses was endless. Past the Penguin and the Shoe Store, another bakery, Sewickley Shoe Repair, a tailor, Schaefer's Flower Shop, and Gaetano Interiors. Looking down Green Street, the church steeple belonged to the old St. James Church, which was in its last years. The new St. James was nearing completion at the corner of Walnut Street and Ohio River Boulevard. We're a little further down Beaver Street. On the left is the home of Gaetano Interiors and Gusky's Women's Wear. Across Walnut Street, Silicley Pharmacy. The building had been painted that year, covering a large advertising sign that had graced the side of the building for years. Past the drugstore, the original location of Yankello's radio and TV shop, and next to that, the linen shop, a women's apparel store that had been recently tastefully renovated. Looking down Walnut Street at another store that had made extensive changes to its facade, 
The A&P had attempted a bright red corporate look, which drew so much criticism that they quickly came up with a redesign. Here's another view of the attractive exterior of the linen shop. You can see why for several years, this was the storefront that was used as a model for other storefront beautification projects in the village. Pretty dull looking. A&P was the nation's largest retailer in the mid 1960s and getting them to change their storefront was a major victory for the garden clubs and other concerned residents and help set the tone for other businesses to follow. Here we are on Locust Street. So Lickley still had a Western Union Telegraph office. A little further up the street, another soon to be rare site, a mailbox in front of Hegner's office supply store, which sold some other items that have disappeared from our lives, typewriters and adding machines. The medical center offices at the corner of Locust and Centennial represented a major improvement in the village. Up until the late 1940s, this was the headquarters of the Chalice Building Supply Company, Piles of sand, gravel, and other paving and construction materials were stored here. When the new owners took over the company in the 1950s, they decided to develop the property as a complex for doctors and dentists offices. These buildings were demolished in 2018 to make way for condominiums. Swickley's main intersection, Beaver and Broad Streets. From a distance, it would appear that not too much has changed over the years. The Coleman building on the left and the former Mellon Bank building on the right are still here today. But moving up the street, we can already see some differences. The Angros Dry Cleaners building is now a real estate office and the bar next door is now a shop. We're now looking down Division Street, named because it was the dividing line between two of the original Commonwealth land grants that made up Sewickley. Walter Z. Walters ran his barber shop here for many years. In the early 1960s, he remodeled the shop so it became half barber shop and half a store for fishing tackle and supplies. Turns out it was a successful combination. Here's another view of the Coleman Building's beautifully redone exterior. The White Building was a bar called Bobby's Nightlife, which was gutted by a fire shortly after this film was shot. It was never rebuilt. Next door, an electronics store, the United Menswear Store, and Sewickley News, better known as the newsstand or the paper store. Just past the newsstand on Beaver Street, the original Sewickley Hotel. This is what the garden clubs were preaching for the village. This is an attractive garden area next to the Bird in the Hand Gallery on Broad Street, part of a then brand new office building constructed by Sam Green, who owns Swickley based Green Engineering Company. And just down the street, sidewalk planters, an idea that the garden clubs had long campaigned. At one point, even offering to supply planters if the businesses would provide the plants. Across Broad Street, Walcott Park, perhaps the greatest testament to the tenacity of the Garden Club members. The park came to be in the 1950s after a fire had destroyed a building there. Led by longtime Garden Club member Mary Walcott, the Garden Clubs worked with the borough to plant and care for the park. Looking back across the street at the Green Office Building, which was at the time the newest structure in the village. Here we are looking down Broad Street from Walcott Park, it was dedicated in honor of Mary Walcott in April of 1968. We see Gourley Chevrolet and the Methodist Church. Another longtime Sewickley business, Louis Trapezona's Amico Station, which has just undergone a renovation to give it more of a Sewickley look. The building in the background is the 1893 Sewickley Elementary School. Louis' tow trucks were a regular sight at auto accident scenes in the valley as the wrecked Chevy on the right will attest. Ascot Foreign Cars and Conley Chrysler Plymouth, two of the seven car dealers in Sewickley at the time. The garden clubs weren't happy with the signs. Art's Brandio's Tire Store. It had once been a gas station, but Art sold more tires than gas, so he decided it was better to focus on the tires. Here we get a look at Sewickley's historic Flatiron Building, so named because its triangular shape is like that of a flat iron. It had been vacant for a number of years when this was shot, it had once been the home of a black owned restaurant and catering business. Another timeless view looking down Broad Street, just across from Gourley Chevrolet.
And this is the other portion of Division Street. Earlier we saw one part of the street between Locust and Broad. Early on it was divided in two by development on Beaver Street. The corner of Thorn and Broad Streets. In the background, John Herbst Esso Station and the historic St. Matthew's AME Church. Here's Sickler's Hardware on Blackburn. Sickler's was one of three hardware stores in town. And also on Blackburn across the street, the Next to New Shop, which provided gently used clothing to a generation of families in the valley. We close with another view of the Medical Center Office Complex on Centennial. It's gone now and the view today is not quite as pastoral, but while change is constant, the village is still the village. And there you have it. It's in 1968, and I hope for many of you, uh, it was a nostalgic look back. It certainly was for me. And uh, for those of you who were not here uh, during that time, I hope it gave you a, a nice uh, background into how Selickley has evolved over the years. And uh, Amanda, I guess we can open it up to uh, questions and comments. Yes, we can. Um, over on the right, you, there is a chat feature if anyone wants to type their question to me. Um, if not, you can unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask. Hopefully we don't have too many firing away. Um, but first, I just want to thank John. He did a fantastic job um, with the narration and the research. He was in here for weeks working on the research for these films. So I just want to appreciate all the work that he did on them. Um, I also, you know, in the, in the research for signals, I had come across a statistic um, that I just wanted to share about the WPA. Um, when all was said and done, 10% of Sewickley's population was employed by WPA projects in Sewickley. Um, that was about 550 people, and they earned collectively $50,000 during the Great Depression. Um, so, you know, small though those projects were, they were a significant thing for people in the Valley. Um, and the other piece of, uh, other thing I wanted to share was that with those curbs, um, the borough only paid $5,000 for all the work that was done. That was, you know, they had to contribute, I think it was like 10% of the total project amount, um, and then the WPA paid for the laborers to come in and do it. Um, so I think it was a pretty good deal. Those curbs are still around. Um, they don't seem to be going anywhere because they're buried so deep and constructed so well. Um, but it was definitely, you know, as I said in signals, everywhere you look, you can find some sort of WPA project that we're still using to the betterment of our lives. So it was a, a great <laughs> initiative in the 30s. So if anyone has any questions, you can 